Hi everyone, I'm Jane, and today we're gonna paint an Impressionist fall path. It's so hot here right now that it feels like it was never going to be autumn, so I decided to paint a little bit of autumn for myself. Thank you again to my sponsor, Frederick's Canvas, who generously supplied the canvas that I used today. Before we get started, make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, so that you can paint with me every week. And then check out the video description below for a full list of materials for today's painting. Now let's get started. Today I have a brand new 12 by 16 inch Frederick's Red Label canvas, and I'm gonna start by putting an underpainting on this. And to do so, I'm gonna use a little bit of alizarin crimson and cadmium orange. So to apply the background color, I'm gonna use my one inch flat brush and wet it in my jar. And I'm just gonna get kind of a random mixture of these two colors. I do wanna keep it a little bit on the lighter side, so more toward the orange, but really it doesn't matter too much. The vast majority of this is not even gonna be visible. We're really just getting rid of the white of the canvas. That's the purpose that an underpainting serves, getting rid of the white. I think my brush is just a little too wet, but that's all right. So I get asked so much whenever I do underpainting, you know, how do you decide what color to use? For the most part, you just kind of decide. I know it seems like there's something magic going on. There's some way that I'm picking the underpainting that I'm just not telling you about, but it really just boils down to using what you want. You know, you can use the exact same color every single time if you like. I have a friend who uses like hot pink, like a really bright magenta fuchsia color on every single painting that he does. And that's just because that's what he likes. Or there's other artists who use like, uh, like raw sienna on every single painting they do. I like to use bright underpaintings that are gonna show. That's just what I like. And I used the orange on this one because it's that nice bright color. But also I felt like it went well with the colors in the foreground since I'm gonna be using the same color mixture on the trees in the foreground, I figured, well, I'll just use it on the underpainting. And that way, if it shows, it's just gonna help me kind of take those leaves that I'm doing in the foreground and kind of spread them around into other areas so that I don't have to focus on adding them there. So that's why I chose this color. But I could very easily do this exact same painting and use magenta or raw sienna or I don't think I'd like to use green because I feel like that would put way too much green in the distance and I wouldn't want to see the green in the sky, but that's just preference. So that's how you choose an underpainting color. You just decide what you want to see. There's nothing magic to it. All right, there my canvas is covered and I'm gonna let that dry just until the paint doesn't lift when I come to it with a wet brush. So maybe 20, 30 minutes tops and then we'll get started. All right, my canvas is now dry and I'm gonna go to my half inch flat brush and I'm just gonna start kind of blocking out the elements. So I'm gonna wet it in my jar and wipe it off on the edge. And I've got three colors here that I'm gonna start using and the first one is Payne's Gray, Cerulean Blue, and cadmium yellow medium. The Payne's Gray, I don't believe, is available in Liquitex Basics. So you'd have to either go with heavy body or the soft body paint. And I'm using heavy body. I may use a little bit of the soft body later for detail work, but it's not required. You don't have to do that. So to start, I'm just gonna use Payne's Gray. I'm just gonna get a little bit. I don't need a lot. I even picked up just a little extra water just because I'm gonna be sketching, so I'm not worried if I underbind my paint here. Just a little bit of paint, not globs of it. It's very, very thin. And I'm gonna start by just blocking out my basic elements. So I'm gonna have my foreground, kinda of want it right about here, kinda of sweeping down a bit, somewhere in there. I'm gonna have a little bit of a road that kind of, I want it to look like it's 
kind of moving uphill just a little bit and maybe disappears around that edge. So I'm gonna come out that way, swoop it around. This is all just very general. This is all gonna change as we start filling it in. And maybe I'll take it down to there. Let's get the other side of it. Remember that in the distance, to make a road look like it's moving away from you and not you know, just going straight uphill, it's very narrow in the distance. See how both sides I've got here almost touch. In fact, there's really no distance between them. The corners, yeah, see, don't go over. Even paint that's supposedly dry, don't go over it too much, you'll start peeling it off. The corners, or where it bends, are it's very sharp in the distance. If it's very smooth, it's gonna seem like it's upright. So we're gonna come out very sharp, and then it can start widening, and see how it's still getting wider, and back around. I might even pull that out just a little bit more. Let's just get a little more paint on there so you can see it. Probably right about there. I'm not worried about where that paint came off because it'll all be filled in. Now in the distance, right back in here, I'm gonna have some quite distant trees, like a, like a forest that's pretty distant. Just using kind of the corner of my brush just to indicate where I want that. I'm not trying to draw trees right now or anything. I just know I want it to basically come up to here. My trees are going off the top here. Maybe they start coming down as we move over here. Just keeping a bit of that wet paint on my brush. Now, if you don't have Payne's Gray, you can make it pretty easily or at least very close to Payne's Gray with a mixture that's very dark of ultramarine and burnt umber. It's much easier to just use Payne's Gray, I feel like, for this painting in particular because I'm gonna already be mixing several colors and having to mix the, the ultramarine and burnt umber is just gonna be an extra step that's gonna make things a little bit more challenging. And then of course I am gonna have other bushes back here or trees or whatever that are kind of halfway between you know where we are and these distant trees so that'll be there maybe a bit along the horizon here let's go ahead and start actually filling in where our trees are so i'm going to take some Payne's gray Payne's gray i know it looks black it is nowhere near as strong as mars black this color is quite translucent and it will not overpower other colors the way Mars Black does. So don't be afraid to get in there and really get a good amount. So I'm gonna get some Payne's Gray. I'm gonna pull some Cerulean into it. See how you can instantly, you can see that Cerulean in there. And just a little bit of yellow, just a little bit. I don't want this too intense of a green. What the Cerulean does is it kind of drabs everything down a little bit. So we get that atmospheric perspective where things in the distance start to look cooler and lighter. So I'm mostly, when I'm doing the top of the trees, I'm mostly gonna be using the corner of my brush like that, just kind of crushing it. So I'm gonna come in here and just kind of like that. See, nothing real specific. So let me zoom you in there so you can see exactly what I'm doing. See how it's just the corner of my brush. And really I'm almost like sketching, kind of scribbling a little bit, see that? Bring it up. Flip it over when there's not much paint left on that side. And because we haven't painted the sky yet, you don't have to worry about, you know, making things too linear. Like here, that's too linear for me. They're, they're all the same height. So I can take one up a little taller, or I can wait, and when I go to do the sky, I can paint over little bits that I don't like. And I know every time I paint the sky last, I get all kinds of questions about, can I just paint the sky first? You can do it however you want to do it. Will it look exactly the same? No, but you can do whatever you like. 
Now down here, these trees I want to be quite distant. So I'm going to help give that illusion in the height, in the color, but also in the size. So I'm not putting quite as much pressure on my brush. I'm getting smaller marks here. So I'm just going to keep going with that, start taking some of these up off the top. Not all of them need to go off the top. See how I'm leaving some of that orange. We'll be putting our sky in, but also if some of that orange still shows, that will be great because it will kind of help these trees seem like they've got maybe a few leaves that are starting to change on them. And I know it's not quite time for autumn paintings, but I need one. I need an autumn painting really, really bad. I just picked up a tiny drop of water there. I don't do summer real well. I've said that before. And this has been such a crazy hot summer. I'm just so ready for fall. So I have had this painting set aside for a little while now and today I decided is the day that I need this painting. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully you guys need this painting too. Just keeping a tiny bit of water. I'm not using it real wet like I did on the background here when I was outlining where the shape of the trees are. I know some of you really hate it when I paint the sky last and I encourage you to not be so resistant to it. You know, it it's really helpful because, you know, I don't have to worry about what shape my trees are now because when I go to do the sky later, I can make adjustments to my trees. But also I get that color coming through from the underpainting and that's going to give some life to my trees that I wouldn't get otherwise. All right, we're really gonna start kind of filling this in, but don't just, you know, back and forth like that. I'm still really using the corner of my brush. Sometimes I will, you know, kind of press flat like that and then break it up from there. But we're gonna add different colors in here. This is gonna look like little different clumps of trees and just fill it in almost sporadically. See how I'm just, Kind of scrubbing a little bit in some spots. My colors are changing and that's okay. A little more of my blue panes mixture, a little more yellow. So what I like to do is kind of just lay flat like that and then spread it out from there. You'll see me doing that a lot today. So while I was on my season break, you know, I kind of opened myself up to being, being able to paint the way that I want to paint rather than, you know, just thinking about tutorials. And that was really liberating. And I kind of noticed that some of the things that I would do changed a little bit. And one of the things that I noticed changed a little bit was, you know, the way that I apply my paint. And that's one of the things I found myself doing a lot it was just kind of putting down a blop like that and then being really loose and quick and spreading it from there. A little blop and spread it. I know we drew in these trees here, but don't worry about them. Paint out all of that, take this color all the way to the horizon. I did get a little bit of titanium white. Make sure to keep a little extra water on your brush if things start to feel a bit gummy. I'm starting to get some gum in there. And I'm going to grab just a little bit of my titanium white. See, not a ton. You don't want to go too light here, but see how that color doesn't look much different on my palette? But look at how dramatically different it is from the rest of the color. So now I'm just kind of taking it. Remember those little C's? The little C shapes? We did that we did that recently. What painting was that? So that's kind of what I'm doing. That helps. I really like the insinuated tree shape 
that I get from doing that. Again, just lay that little splat down, take those little C shapes up. The brush stroke I'm doing there for the, the C shapes is, it's really just the tip of my brush, see that? And I'm kind of going like that. It's a little bit of a bounce, you know, and the quicker you do it, the more messy it's gonna look. It's not gonna look, you know, that tidy. You don't want it to look that tidy. But see how that almost looks like a distant tree? So that's what I'm doing here. But you know, different techniques work for different people. People understand different techniques in different ways. So if that doesn't make sense to you, but something else does, then do that. See how as I get to the top here, I'm going back to the corner of my brush and filling in some of this color into there. Notice there's still quite a bit of this orange showing through and um, most of that will be gone, you know, by the time we're, we're done. I just picked up a little extra white with a little extra of this cerulean blue because especially right here, if we go quite blue and light, that is really gonna push those trees off into the distance. I know right now against that hot orange, it seems it doesn't seem, you know, like it's really putting it into the distance. It just seems blue, but hang tight. I promise you will agree that it helped push those trees into the distance. Let's just get a bit of it in here. If your color is still quite wet and as you start applying other colors, it lifts it, pulls it off. Just let this dry. You can let this dry completely and then come back and do it. You don't have to work quick so that these blend. In fact, I'm gonna let that dry for a minute because I am noticing a little bit of pulling. I'm gonna come over here and finish filling that in. So without the white, Payne's gray, cerulean blue, and a little bit of yellow. So cerulean blue is not one of my favorite colors. It's Kind of a drab blue, I feel like. But using it in landscapes, especially to kind of help create atmospheric perspective, it's so helpful. So that's why you'll be seeing me use it a little bit more often. You know, while I was on break, I thought, I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself use colors that I don't typically use. And I have a lot of cerulean blue paint. I don't know why I have so much of it. And I never use it. So I picked, you know, some landscapes to do and, and you know, just to kind of challenged myself to focus on the atmospheric perspective, to find colors that would help, you know, kind of create that illusion. And cerulean blue, I realized, wow, that is really, really helpful for that. So. I've been using a little bit more water. I've been using a lot of cerulean blue lately. As well as these short angular brush strokes. You know, it just get that paint on there. Don't don't obsess over filling in all the little spots. Just lay it down, scoot it around if you need to, and move on to the next spot. where we started adding colors for the atmospheric perspective. Now, one of the fun things we can do here is create different layers of trees, and we can do that simply by changing our color. So I've got this nice pale color, almost looks like it's foggy. I'm gonna grab a little more black. Well, it's Payne's Gray, sorry, not it's not black. 
a little more cerulean. Maybe just a hint of yellow. A little more water. It's really hot here today. My paint is drying a lot faster than it normally does. I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna overlap this color and I'm not gonna blend it. So I'm gonna lay it down on the horizon there and take those little C shapes up in front of it. Let's play around with the color mixtures too. I just pulled a little extra yellow in there. It's the same mixture I did there. And I'll lay some down there. See, it's a little bit greener. I'm not gonna take it all the way down. Kinda in between some of those shapes. Maybe I'll take this color all the way up here. Just keep experimenting with the colors, you know. As long as you're using the same colors, you know, I'm using these same three colors and a little bit of white, it doesn't matter what your mixture is. I know some of us really like to have the exact same, you know, color mixture every time we go back to our palette. If we can't pick up the exact same color, we get frustrated, but oh, that's what I like the best is, you know, kind of not having that control. Just picking up whatever I pick up and you know, either finding a way to make it work where I want it, or, you know, challenging myself to change it a little bit. But don't micromanage. And, you know, another thing that I don't want you guys to do, I know it's gonna happen though, because it always does, is for you to come in here and say, oh, I have to fill in this little spot exactly. Don't do that. Do it like that. Impressionist painting is really a great way to loosen up. I think that if you allow yourself to loosen up a little bit, you're going to find that you're much happier with the outcome. Maybe not right at first. You know, that doesn't mean that the very first time you decide to loosen up that you're going to come away with with a painting that just blows your mind you might not it's really awkward loosening up is hard and it feels like to me anyway that it should be the other way around that painting very tight and detailed should be the difficult way to paint and the challenging way to paint but it's it's not time I just mixed the Payne's gray with the yellow maybe a little bit of white didn't pull any any extra cerulean into that and we'll see what happens there but if you can paint loose and effortlessly. For me, I find that when I started allowing myself to paint looser, I started to be so much happier with my paintings and I felt like I learned and grew so much more at that time than when I was agonizing over, you know, every single brush stroke. I don't like to agonize. So I'm trying to take that ability away from myself. No agony. Art should be, you know, about expressing yourself and enjoying your time and learning and just having fun. Why agonize? Ugh. We should be painting to get away from things that we agonize over. 
I'm not putting in so much white over here on this side like I did over here because these trees are taller, they're closer to us. So we don't really have so much of the atmospheric perspective pushing them back. And that's really what this lighter color does. We might have a little bit, a little more water. We might have a little bit, you know, to say that there are some more distant trees that are kind of showing. So let's say maybe right up in here toward the top. I'm just gonna throw in a hint of this color and say maybe those trees are quite distant. Quite, quite distant. Maybe it's even misty or foggy back there. Break it up. And now I'm gonna come back with a darker color. Maybe throw a little extra yellow in there, get it a bit greener. Because the more green it is, the closer it's going to seem to us. The more blue it is, the more distant it's going to seem. And now I can come in with this darker, greener color and pull it over top of that kind of grayed out blue color. And that will help push those into the background. Doesn't really matter because I'm going to put another set of trees in a completely different color here. I think that's pretty good. The last thing I want to do is just really kind of kick this bottom, the bottom of that area, kind of in the corner, just right in that one little spot with a color that's quite a bit lighter. That is way too dry. My paint doesn't normally dry this quick. See, I'm just dusting it, very light pressure. I'm not gonna take it all the way up. Kind of make it look like maybe there's some mist on the ground. Just a little bit in here. See, my brush is almost not even touching. And that paint is wearing off and kind of blending in with the color that's there, which is helping me get that look kind of faded out. You can go back and you can touch up these colors however you like. I think I'm about done. I might just, you know, pop some little misty parts into a couple of spots, maybe punch a couple dark, darker spots here and there. Then I think I'll be met ready to move on. Make sure you're holding your brush at the end and stand back as far as you can. That way you can kind of see the whole picture and be better able to judge where you need some some highlights and some shadows. I actually think that's good. I think I'm done with that. All right, let's go ahead and fill in our ground here. I'm gonna use my half inch brush still and I cleaned it off. I'm just gonna use the yellow and the Payne's gray, but I'm just gonna mix it right here. It's okay if I accidentally pick up a little bit of the blue or the white, that doesn't matter. But I'm really just gonna focus on the yellow and Payne's gray. Nice dark, dark green. And again, I'm just kind of getting it on the edge there. Press flat and move it out from there. I'm gonna go right over that horizon. If I have a hard line there at the horizon, things are gonna look awkward. My foreground and my background could look like they exist in two totally different places. See, I'm still using the corner of my brush quite a bit just to get nice soft shapes. Don't worry about all those orange holes. They don't matter. 
actually they do matter that's why we painted it orange so what i mean is don't try and fill them all in because then you painted it orange for no reason if you're just going to cover it soft edges at your road you don't want to have hard edges at your road otherwise it's not going to look like a overgrown you know old road just do it quick challenge yourself if you are a slow painter and I know I've always told you that speed isn't the issue and it's not that's not what I'm saying I'm not telling you you need to paint faster what I'm telling you is if you find that you're a slower painter and you feel like your paintings are always quite tight, then speed up, hold your brush far back, stand far back. So you have to reach and one big stroke like that, fill in that section, you know, rather than coming in here and, and doing like this, don't do that far back, all of the pressure just get that whole section filled in I've been if you've read my blog while I was on break I was telling you that I you know I buy a lot of art books and I buy a lot of art books that aren't even related to acrylic painting and for a little while there I was kind of on an oil book kick I was reading a lot of oil painting books and kind of traditional oil painting methods are you know exactly what I was just showing you where you just kind of decide that you need to fill in a space and just do a big streak of color you know and I don't do it just like oil painters do because they'll really like count it out and say okay it's going to take me this many brush strokes like that to fill in this section I'm much I'm much looser than that with it I don't I don't have the the patience to you know, sit and count. But I did really like just laying down a fat brush stroke like that and then kind of breaking it up. So that's what I've been doing. And I feel like the looseness that I get in my painting from doing that is very pleasing. I really like that. So I encourage you to try that. I know some of you don't like to be mean to your brushes. You want to treat them very nicely. But guess what? Here's an important fact. Brushes are replaceable, but if you don't, if you're afraid to use them in whatever way you need to use them to get the look that you want, the learning experience that you're missing out on is much more valuable than the price of a brush. So abuse your brush however you need to, to get the job done, because that's what the brush is there for. You will never learn what you need to learn by being nice and gentle with a replaceable brush. Okay, I got a little bit of my cadmium orange because we're gonna start making the road and I don't wanna have to bring brown out. So I'm just gonna mix a brownish neutral color with the colors that I'm using in the rest of the painting. So let's start with some Payne's Gray. Not a ton of it. That was way too much. A little bit of cerulean and let's pull some orange into that a little more cerulean and some white that's an okay color I think to start let's just darken it a bit and again very loose I don't care if I go over the green of my grass those long full brush strokes to just lay that color down and that is a very thin color I'm gonna mix it up a little bit heavier really like to use brown paint in a tube except for mixing I really like to keep you know a couple of brown colors around to mix but as far as like using brown paint as 
a brown color. I find that they all just look kind of phony. You know, that it's like, everything looks like chocolate. But this is like a nice gray brown and it doesn't look like chocolate. So we don't have a chocolate road. And I like that. But if you really want to use, you know, a, a tube color for your brown, you can do that. It boils down to preference. Let's just kind of thicken up this color back here and then we'll move on. We'll fill in the sky. See how there's no definite line between my road and the ground? Sometimes my brush stroke overlaps the road. Sometimes it grabs a little of that green and mixes it and that's okay too. All right, let's go ahead and paint in our sky. Still my half inch flat brush. I'm gonna go into my Cerulean and Payne's Gray and just pick up a little bit of each. Not a ton, we don't wanna make our sky too dark. I'm gonna come in here to my white and just, it's very loose. I just kind of pulled some white into that mixture. I didn't really you know, spend too much time mixing them. Now the way that I made the trees, how I used the corner, I'm gonna start filling in the sky the same way. I'm not worried if I go over my tree. I'm not worried if the orange still shows. And this is another part where we do this sometimes and I tell you, oh, loosen up. And then I'll see some of the paintings where it looks like you've gone in here and you've been so careful to keep it just on the orange. Don't do that, you're gonna make yourself crazy. Just, I'm almost not really looking at what section I'm working on. Let me zoom you in there really close and see if I can kind of explain to you my thought process while I'm doing this, okay? So let's say I decide I'm going to fill in this little spot next. I'm going to start at the top and I'm going to come down into here. Well, I'm looking at the top because that's where I'm going to start, but before my brush even touches it, I'm looking at where I'm going to put my next brush stroke. So it's like I'm looking ahead of where I am. I'm not looking at right there and analyzing how that went. I'm just saying, all right, I'm gonna start up there. I'm looking at that, the next part that I'm gonna be in and deciding, you know, do I need to turn my brush over right there, take it down a little bit, add little windows, little sky windows is what they're called. Don't forget to take it up off the edge so it'll look like it's kind of, you know, continuing. But that's what I'm doing, and I know that looks really weird because you're looking at it in, I mean, super up close, but also because it's the only part of the sky that's done, so it doesn't look like sky. But hang tight for just a second. I'll zoom you back out, we'll finish up, and it will start to look like sky. And just like always, let your color be a little bit different Every time you go back for some more, maybe I'm just gonna pick up a tiny bit more of my Payne's Gray that time. See, anything you don't like that your trees did, cover it up. Just put some of this color over it. Like right there, I think that little part looks weird, so I'm just gonna cover it up. Now it doesn't look weird because it's not there anymore. And even in my sky, my color is a little thinner and there's little bits of the orange that are showing in there. And I know that while you're standing there painting it, particularly if this is new to you and you're thinking that I'm insane right now, <laughs> and I'm just totally making this up as I go along, you're gonna see those little orange spots and you're gonna wanna cover them and you're gonna, you know, probably curse me, but I encourage you to leave them because when somebody comes in to look at your painting, they're not gonna stand, you know, six inches away from your painting. If they are and they're doing it to, you know, judge your painting, then they're, they have issues, not you. I just grabbed a little bit more white and I'm just adding a couple points of some lighter color, just kind of breaking up the color a little bit, because I want it to seem like maybe there's some clouds back there. I'm not going in here to try and 
cover up more of the orange. I'm just changing the color just a little bit in a few spots. I think that's good. Let's move on to the other side. Now that we're getting into the area with some, you know, larger sky, we can start kind of playing with these brush strokes and the color and see how it all works together. Again, that flat pressure, break it up from there. I think as I move this way, I might lighten my color just a little bit. Flat pressure, flat pressure, break it up. So part of what Impressionism is, is using colors to insinuate other colors. And that's one of the reasons that I do these bright underpaintings, because the colors on their own, you know, that you use in the sky, very cool colors that can make a painting feel very cold. But if we have this warm underpainting under it, that kind of glows through, it keeps that blue gray from seeming so cold. It still feels like an autumn sky, but you know how when you are in an autumn area, how everything seems to have a warm glow to it. So even the sky, right? You might look up and the sky is blue or it's gray, but that's just the way the season is. Everything just feels like it has a warm glow. And that's what the orange underpainting kind of helps with. I picked up quite a bit more white. Flat, laying that down, breaking it up. But you know, if I mixed the orange in with this blue-gray, we most certainly would not get a blue sky. <laughs> we would get a sky, maybe the color of the road that I did at the bottom, kind of a muddy brown color. And I don't want that. Layering colors does things a little different than mixing. And painting on top of an underpainting and letting that color show through the edges like this is you know, one way that you can use colors that you wouldn't really want to mix. Almost done here. You know, if you wanted to make this seem like a, a really bright summer day, then just by changing your underpainting color, that would go a long way toward giving you that feeling. So if you wanted summer, maybe, I mean, for me, if I were picking, it would really depend on the colors that I was using. But if I were doing this really close, maybe with some, some really yellowy greens in the foreground, I might pick magenta or even like deep violet as my underpainting color rather than orange because I feel like they would work really well with the yellowy greens of the trees and grasses and everything but also if little bits of it poked through it might be interpreted as flowers you know in the spring and in the summer you've got a lot of flowers. So if little bits of purple or pink show through in the grass or in the trees, they could be interpreted as flowers. Just don't be afraid to try things, you know? Even if you don't understand them, even if you think that I am absolutely insane for letting 
this hot orange show in my sky, I encourage you to try it. Okay, that is all filled in. I am just gonna pop a little bit of white in here, kind of insinuating clouds, really in the same way I did my trees. So that little C shape brush stroke, but I'm kind of going sideways with it instead of straight up and down. I like that dark spot up at the top. I might actually continue that. Maybe it'll feel like there's some heavy clouds up here. All right, I am ready to move on now. Okay, there's the beginning of our painting. Everything else is really gonna be about creating details and brightness. Give us something really to look at here. But the next step is gonna be to create the trees that are in the distance between us and the distant trees. So right along the horizon here, that's gonna start pulling us down into the foreground. So I really am just gonna stick with my half inch and I've got some more alizarin crimson and my Payne's gray, and those are the colors that I'm gonna use. It's really gonna give us a very dark, almost kind of purpley color, which is gonna play really well with those bits of orange that are showing. Got a little drip of water. I'm gonna get some Payne's gray, a good amount, and lay it over here, mix some alizarin into it. A really, a very similar thing to what we did in the background. It's just, let's see, we'll start by laying down that and just let it blend in with the, the ground there because we are gonna include some of it there too. Just laying that color down and then the little C shapes will start breaking it up. Kind of bringing it up a bit, use the corner to give us some random edge shapes. Don't stress this part too much. Really, once we start adding the trees and everything, and once it dries, you're really just gonna kinda have a hint of this here. So just get it on there, and don't, don't get too worried about what it looks like. If it airs a little more on the side of red, that's okay too. Take that up a bit there. And take a hint of it in the horizon here. Just lay it down, break it up a little bit because I don't want a hard line in there. Just a tiny bit scraped in there. And we'll do a little bit right in here. You can see those better because of the light color of those distant trees. Let's just start kind of pulling that down in here. Not covering everything, just like I said, almost randomly. Lay down that fat swipe of color. Almost kind of scrub, just bring it down a little bit. Maybe I want a little bit in this corner too. I think I'm gonna let that dry for a few minutes because I'm gonna start adding my bright colors now and I wanna keep those colors bright. And if the orange were to mix with that purple or even if any of this green is still wet, it's gonna drab the color down and I don't want that. So I'm gonna wait until that's dry and then we'll be back. All right, from here on out, I'm pretty much gonna be using my number eight filbert. And notice how puffy and really old and beat up my filbert is. Because the puffiness is gonna help me get shapes and textures that just aren't so tight and kind of blobby. And I don't want any tight blobby textures. I want really puffy, wispy textures. So I am gonna wet this in my jar and then just wipe a bit off 
on the edge. So we'll start over here on this far right side. I am gonna load up with some alizarin crimson, just alizarin crimson, and notice I did pick it up fairly thick. There's a little bit of a ball on my brush. Now, just because I know that I made my horizon right here, and that's the ground, doesn't mean that I need to take my alizarin all the way there. I wanna make it seem quite dark here. Maybe there's some darker foliage or a shadow or whatever, but so I'm not going to take this color all the way back there. I'm gonna start it maybe right about in here. And I'm gonna be really random with this. I'm gonna be pretty random. I don't want my paint to be quite that thick. So where it's thick, I'm just kind of nudging it upwards. See, so like that? Just to get rid of some of that thickness. Now, alizarin is quite transparent. So as it dries, that color is gonna deepen and fade in just a little bit more. Right now, it shows up quite well but it's not gonna show up quite that well once it's dry. See, very sporadic. As the paint starts to wear off, you can tap it back into here a little bit just to make sure that we don't have, you know, like a weird line where the two colors meet. And still, I've kind of swiped to lay down a little bit of that color. I'm kind of dabbing to break it up. And since this brush is already all, you know, messy and puffy, I'm not worried about damaging it. And it's like I told you before, you know, if you're afraid of damaging a brush, then you might not get the experience out of it that you need to. Clearly, if you do a lot of precision painting, so obviously we're moving over to this spot now for a second while I talk. If you do a lot of precision painting, you might want to have, you know, two brushes on hand. So a nice filbert and a filbert that you can let get puffy. I have at least two of these brushes on hand that I use, but I actually don't ever use the nice one. I just really stick to my old puffy one. I'm gonna take some of that red right up in there. And notice, I don't know if you can see that, my alizarin, I didn't just take it sideways. So just like in the rusty truck last week, I'm insinuating that this hillside moves up by the way I took the crimson. So it kind of sweeps up and that's helping us to say that this moves uphill. So see, I have quite a bit down here toward the edge of the road. And then as it comes up, moving it up and letting it taper out. If I do it straight across, it's gonna seem like flat ground. Let's stick to this side for a minute. A little bit of my crimson right in here. Don't worry about getting too much of any of the colors that we're about to do, because if it's too much, cover it with another color or you know, add the green back in. That's okay too. Right now, just kind of put some of this alizarin where you feel like you might want to see it later. If we end up covering it up completely, that's okay, it comes back. All right, let's go into, I did not clean off my brush. Let's go into a little bit of our cadmium orange. A little bit more water, and I'm gonna pull more alizarin into it. So this is really very similar to the color that we did on the background, the underpainting. And I'm gonna do a very similar thing. Just like when we're blending, you know how when we're doing a nice blend, I tell you start well below the last color and then blend up into it. We're gonna do the same thing because if I take this brush with a good load of paint and blop it right there on that alizarin crimson, I'm gonna lose all of that but if I start down here below it, then I can work up into it and we've got a nice transition there. See? And look at what I'm doing with my brush. I am kind of, I'm being super random. A Little bit of almost a scrub, sometimes nice little dabs. Experiment and see what different brush strokes do for you. And what do you like the best? And maybe you'll find that you like 
the tighter, more orderly brush strokes the best. And that's fine. I do encourage you to try, you know, to work a little bit looser, but if you get a hard transition line between the two colors, like I've got some hard transition lines there, don't worry about it right now. See, I'm just leaving it. Obviously, I don't want it to be like that, but I'm just going to leave it for now. Let's pull a bit of it down in here. Maybe I'll get a little bit more orange, not pick up any extra alizarin. So it's a bit brighter. Let's get it right up to the edge of that road. And again, I can make this grass seem like it moves down toward the road here. And that's by coming up here and then turning like that. Just interesting little things that you can do so that your paintings don't, you know, feel static and flat. Just give little bits of shape and life, just simply by the direction that your paintbrush goes. It's that easy. I'm gonna start bridging that transition just a tiny bit of orange. See, I didn't pick up a ton of it. I feel like there's a bit of a weird transition here between the one with the alizarin and the brighter orange. So, very light pressure. See? Just make sure they overlap a little bit more. And that's actually about how I'm gonna fix the weird transition I have there. In fact, I'm gonna do that now. So I cleaned off my brush. I'm gonna get a little bit of alizarin, not a ton. And where that weird mark is, I'm gonna start right there and bring that up. So that kind of, because the alizarin is transparent, is gonna help that orange seem like it's fading into the background. And then we can always pick up a little more orange See, no more weird transition there. Let's continue that orange down just a little bit more before we move on. Mostly just using the edge of my brush, kind of the side right now. Little bright pops here and there. Tiny, tiny bit. See those little understated bright pops. Let's go do some of that on this side here. So my alizarin with a little bit of orange. And I'm going to keep this side a little bit darker. I feel like there's maybe not quite as much light on this side. So really, I'm just barely letting my brush even touch. Not scrubbing a ton of that color into here. Maybe right here, there's a little bit of extra light shining. So we can pop that a bit. Just some orange, pop a bit in there. And I can already tell you that's gonna be way too bright for me. 
If yours went that bright and you like it, that's fine. You can leave it. I don't want to see orange quite that bright right there. But again, notice I don't drop everything to try and correct it because the only thing I'm going to do if I try and correct it is either smear it around more and make it worse or if I try and cover it with another color right now, that other color is just going to blend in with it and again make it worse. So I'm just going to leave it. All right, now before we finish our grass, what I want to do is add in at least my tree trunks. That way my trees don't look like they're floating on top of the grass on the ground. So I'm going to use my soft body just because it's a lot easier to do detail work with the soft body than it is the, the heavy body. I'm going to use my number five round brush, just wet it in my jar. And because I'm using soft body paint, I don't have to use extra water. I'll load up with the Payne's Gray, my whole brush, just fill it up with this color. And I'm going to come in here and just get a tiny, just a tiny point of white. See that? Decide where I want the bottom of my tree. And I think probably right about in here and a good amount of pressure. Just kind of let my brush wiggle and move up. Don't judge your color right now. Just get the shape on there. Let's widen that out. You can twist your brush a little if you need to. I know sometimes some of you guys have a hard time with that. So don't worry about that if that's something that you aren't comfortable doing. Just get a really gnarly shaped tree. Lots of personality. Do not go overboard on branches here though, okay? We're gonna do two, maybe three main branches. Then we're gonna do our foliage and we can add little detail branches after. Just add a little more pressure as you go down to widen that out. See, I'm not worried about what the bottom of that tree looks like. It's all gonna be covered up. Let's widen this one a bit. Nice and tall. And then maybe we'll have just one third branch poking off here somewhere. And that's really all I'm gonna do right now on this tree. Let's do another one, just kind of smaller, maybe, let's see, right about in here. I know I've already got my, my grasses in there, but it's not done, so that's fine. It won't look like it's floating. I know it looks like it's floating right now. Widen that out a little. This is just gonna be a very small, very simple tree. All right, let's finish up the ground. I'm going back to my number eight filbert and I'm gonna mix up a green. So I'm gonna use the Payne's Gray and yellow. No cerulean because the cerulean, remember, that kind of grays the green down a little bit and pushes it into the distance. We want a nice, dark, rich color that's gonna be here in the foreground with us. All right, so I have my green. Maybe I'll darken it just a little bit more. A little extra water. And since this is grass, and I wanna just kind of break up the shapes I'm doing here, I'm gonna start down and kind of use it like a fan brush. So just the tip of the brush is gonna be down there and flick up. And in fact, you could use a fan brush here if you really want to. What I'm doing is just breaking everything up. I want to make sure that I don't lose all of that green that I put under here. But also, I don't want just like a, a rainbow from red to yellow, you know, that goes toward the road. I want to make sure it stays broken up and wild. I'm even going to come in here with very light pressure. 
me show you exactly the brush stroke I'm doing here. It's just the tip of the brush like that. That's all I'm doing. I'm not doing like that. See how much paint I have on my brush? So I'm really depositing little bits that kind of look like grass. So you can come back here if you don't like something and just kind of, you know, lightly scratch over it. I didn't obliterate that orange that was there. I just kind of, you know, knocked it back a little bit. Put a little bit back in here. Very light pressure. I know I'm moving quickly and so it probably seems like I'm putting a lot of pressure on my brush and I'm not. Barely, barely. I'm almost not even depositing any paint. When I decide I want more, I can put a little bit heavier pressure because I want to keep some green toward the road there. Right now, I'm not going to worry about the details in the road. I'm just going to kind of knock a bit of that back. See, no hard line between where the grass starts and where the orange bits, which, you know, it's either dry grass or fallen leaves. It's whatever you want it to be. It's fall colors. But I don't want a hard line where the green meets the, the orange. Put down a good blob there to just kind of hide the bottom of that tree for a minute. Some brighter green in there. Let's get darker. I'm going to pull some more Payne's Gray in. Nice dark, dark, dark green. A little extra water. This color, I am going to take all the way to the edge of the road. See that? How now I'm in the road. When I hit the road, I can kind of use still the tip of the brush, just kind of scrub it out just a little bit. Up right there where it's obviously the grassy area. And maybe just out a little horizontal perpendicular to the bottom edge of your canvas. So I'll show you what I mean in a minute. But just to give you an idea, it's up here where it's grass and down here where we're on the road, we're going horizontal. Let me just finish filling this in. I'll pan you down a bit so you can see the road and I'll show you what I mean and why. up and at the edge of the road just kind of lightly scribble it out horizontal really blur the line between the road and the grass even back here I feel like that is all just way too bright so I'm going to knock that back a bit Back in here. Remember your brush strokes should get a little smaller, a little shorter as you move into the distance there. And I'm still gonna take that out a bit into the road, horizontal. Don't follow the road. So over here, I'll show you what I mean about going perpendicular to the edge of your canvas. So if I'm doing the grass on the road and I'm trying to follow the direction the road is going and I take it out like that, it almost, to me, it kind of makes the road flat. It says that it's, you know, up and down rather than laying flat. But if I do it horizontal, that kind of gives you the illusion of flatness. And to make sure that you're going horizontal, because sometimes you can look at a shape like this and feel like you're going horizontal when really you're moving in relation to this shape. So look at the bottom of your canvas because that is horizontal. So we're gonna come in here. Let's make this color just a little bit brighter just so we can see the difference because the ground is quite dark here. So I'm going up and down here, right? Got my grasses that move up as I get to the road. And then just make sure that line is kind of scrubbed out. 
and follow the edge of the canvas. So kind of look at how the canvas moves here while you're doing that line if it helps you. Kind of compare the line that you just made to the edge of the canvas. If it's angled like that, then fix it. Bring it more like that. Let's finish this up. This is all pretty dark over here. And I want to leave it like that because over here is where my focus is, where the trees are. So I'm not going to put a whole lot of energy into this. I'm just going to kind of kick back a little bit of this brightness. Remember I said, oh, that's too bright. Well, now I can kind of knock it back a little bit by taking a hint of this green and just lightly dashing it over that orange. The orange is still there, but it's not as bright now horizontal to the to the canvas or perpendicular to the canvas just knock this back a little bit and if it's so bright that you know adding a little bit of green grass over it is really not doing anything then just paint it over completely paint it out that's okay too Whatever you need to do. A little bit of some bright grasses there toward the road. And I, no, I am not done with the road. I know you're probably looking at the road thinking that road doesn't look very good. You're right, it doesn't. Because it's not done. I'm going to add just a tiny hint of a brighter green in here in just a couple of places. Then we can finish up the bright colors. Because I don't want the bright colors to just stop right there. All right, back into my orange. I might have to get some more <laughs> about out. And very light pressure, just kind of scratch in some of this brightness right there where we added some of those grasses. See how I'm barely touching, barely, barely touching, just adding little hints of this color. There's no alizarin mixed in with this orange, it is just the orange. So we can get a little bit sporadic. Let some of those grasses that we just did show. See how I'm leaving little empty spots? That kind of helps give a sense of depth. If it's just, you know, blanket, a single color, then it just looks kind of flat. But if you leave these interesting little holes like that, it kind of says that maybe this grass is quite deep. I'll take just a little bit of this down toward the road. intense than I wanted right there. That's okay, I'm not worried about it. To take care of it, I'm just gonna mix a little bit of alizarin in with that orange on my brush. Just get that, you know, really warm color again. And just kind of go over it there, just like we did before. You know, just put the next color in if one color didn't work. In fact, I'm gonna go more alizarin. I'm gonna let that dry and we'll see. I'll probably come back and completely change that 
I'm really not pleased with how that's looking. Just in that one ugly little spot there. I cleaned off my brush and let's get just a little bit, just a tiny poke of the CAD yellow. And I'm gonna use the edge of my brush, not flat. And I'm just gonna kind of pop just a couple of spots, nice and bright. See, nothing too intense. Just enough to say maybe there's some, maybe there's some good light really shining over this direction. I don't think I'm going to take it any farther this way. I'm going to keep it right about here. Maybe move it this way just a hint until it kind of disappears off my brush. See how there's still just a, the tiniest hint of it coming off there. Maybe I will put just a little poke of it right here. All right, we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of a break from the bright colors for a minute and go back to our road. So I'm still using my number eight Filbert and I've wet it in my jar. We're gonna mix up that neutrally color again. So I'm gonna get a little Payne's gray, a little yellow, a little orange. It doesn't matter if you mix it up different than you did the first time. It really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that it's kind of a neutrally color. It's a little on the orange side, so I'm gonna get a little bit of my cerulean. A little bit of water. And some white, let's see how we're doing there. And it's a bit green, I'm gonna throw a little hint of alizarin in there. Just keep doing it until you have a color that, you know, it's not green or orange or blue or red. It's just kind of neutral. and just a little bit lighter than what we have on our canvas already. Okay, I think that's good. Now again, horizontal, horizontal, perpendicular to the bottom of the canvas. Don't do highlights on the road that follow the direction of the road. Now I'm mostly just gonna use, again, the edge of my filbert, keeping an eye on the bottom of my canvas. I'm just gonna come out. I'm kind of scribbling back and forth it's okay if it touches the grass. It's not going all the way across because I am gonna have, you know, a bit of grass in the middle. Our road is gonna have like some wheel ruts. Take some back up in here. Just kind of scribbling back and forth. Just mixed up a little more color and it ended up being a little bit different and that's okay. See, it can go over the grass. It doesn't have to blend in with the grass. I actually should have done the center part of the road before we did this, but that's okay. I've already started this. I'll just keep going for a minute. Throw a little extra white in there. Just start lightening the color a little. I do want to keep a bit of water on my brush. I kind of feel like this looks like there's a little bit of water settling in the, in the ruts of the road or you know, just kind of reflecting some of the sky a bit. So as it gets lighter, if you like, you can throw a little extra blue into it to make it seem like it's reflecting the sky. I may do that. I want to get the center in there before I do too much more. So I'm just going to finish this color and then I'll do the center of the road. Let's go into our green just with the, the 
black and the yellow, the paint's gray and the yellow. And I didn't clean off my brush, because I don't care. And we're gonna do the same thing we did in the grasses here, just the tip of the brush. I'm just gonna lightly flick it upward. Let's get a little bit more Payne's Gray so it's super dark in a couple places. You can scribble just a little bit, kind of like we just did with those lighter colors, and then flick some little grasses up. It doesn't have to look like anything in particular. Super old road. Doesn't get used very often anymore. Scribble even a little of that grass out into the ruts, just like we did on the edges there. Here, because it's just kind of awkward, I am gonna take my line up like that, but then I'm gonna break it out horizontally. Sometimes you might have to go against what you know you should do in order to just get the paint on the canvas, and then you can change it after that. Here, I'm just gonna insinuate I'm gonna wet that down a bit more. I'm just gonna insinuate that there's a little bit of grass there that you really can't see because that's off in the distance. Let's go a little bit brighter and we'll just kind of touch in a couple of interesting brighter spots. We don't want everything to be so dark. I know everything is super dark right now, but it's not gonna end up being super dark. Told you, that's pretty bright. So we can either cover that up later or we can just kind of pop that brightness in a few other spots to make it look not so out of place. And that's kind of what I've decided I'm gonna do. One thing that I really don't want you guys to do is, you know, get frustrated. I do not want you looking at your painting and saying, oh, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like her painting. And your painting shouldn't look like my painting. It should look like your painting. I'm just here to kind of guide you and show you some techniques. How your painting ends up turning out is, you know, that's unique to you and you should be proud of that. Your goal should never be to make your painting look just like mine. Because that's not art. That's, I don't know, that's something else. That's being a, a photocopier, you know? You don't want to be a photocopier, you want to be an artist. Just punch them back some of those ones that were just a little too bright. Let's finish the road now. So see I'm using kind of the colors I'm using are just a little on the blue slash green side because I have a lot of that on my palette but that orange underneath glowing through helps add that earthy tone to it. It makes it seem a little bit more brown. So let's go back in. I'm gonna get my muddy color again only this time I'm gonna throw a bit of my dried up cerulean in it. I want it to be a little more on the blue side this time because we're gonna go quite light. These are gonna be the highlights in the water or on the road, the lightest part. See how there's a little bit of blue in there now? Just the tip of the brush. And just in a few places, I'm not gonna put this color throughout the entire road. That's not gonna look very realistic. You know, we're just gonna say, oh, there's a little bit, maybe right there. See, just scratching it in. If your filbert was not 
you know, puffy and awesome. We're not going to say destroyed because it's not destroyed. <laughs> but if your filbert wasn't puffy and awesome like mine before you started this painting, it probably will be. And I think that's a good thing. I keep telling myself it's, it's time to, you know, hang this filbert up. Get a new one. But then I look at the way I use it and I think, well, yeah, but if I get a new one, it's just going to, it's going to look the same way <laughs> after one painting anyway. So I might as well just keep using this one. Just like always, if that color is too light or it doesn't blend in properly in a place, it stands out too much, just take your your darker color and just overlap it just a tiny bit. I might do that just right there. That line is kind of bugging me. I'm very loose with my mixture. I'm not going for anything in particular, just a color that's a little bit darker. And there. That's pretty much all I needed to do, I felt like. Just knock that back just a little. One more bit on the road and then we're done with it for a minute. I'm just going to go into my pure white. I might pick up just the tiniest speck of that lighter color, but mostly it's just white. And in just a couple spots in these little puddle bits, I'm just going to apply a tiny hint of this light color. See, not much. Not very much at all. We are going to do one more thing to the road before we're finished, but it's going to take two seconds. And it'll probably be the last thing we do before we sign up. All right, we're going to put some foliage on our trees. This is really going to be quite similar to how we did the ground. I'm going to start with my alizarin. Actually, I think I'm going to start with my alizarin, but I'm going to mix just a tiny bit of the cad orange into it, so not a ton. Just a bit, because that alizarin is so transparent and, and dark. There. I think that's good. That's what we'll start with. So I will be doing the same type of thing, just kind of a, just kind of a, a bounce with the tip of the brush. And I can start on a branch, but then I'm going to bring it off of the branches. So those branches are really just there to give me an idea of where to start but I'm not gonna cluster these shapes on the branches. So this branch actually stops right here. You probably can't see that. I'm actually gonna start this right up here. Maybe I'll even take some of it off the top of the canvas. What did we do? We did something very similar before where I had you do a couple of little branches and then completely ignore them when we went to do foliage. See those interesting little shapes that I get from bouncing my brush? It's like a, it's almost like a, a little hill or something. I think that that's a really nice shape for tree foliage. So I am gonna put you into time lapse for this part just because it's the same thing Let's go into our orange. I am just picking up orange. Now I'm gonna be strategic with this just because I don't want my trees to just turn a whole light color. So I'm really just gonna decide on like a section to do this on and that's where I'm gonna stick. So I'm gonna do some up here toward the top. Not trying to cover all of that, that red. But what I'm getting at is I'm not going to cover this entire tree in this color. It's 
see now you can kind of start to see it almost gives you a little leaf shapes see I left some of that red right in there didn't even cover it sometimes my orange is quite heavy sometimes it's very thin didn't pick up any more of that orange there's just a hint of it on my brush so I'm just gonna take what I can into here and just give just a little flavor of that orange we can do a bit into this little tree here again being selective where I put it little bit of the cadmium yellow the tiniest bit tiniest tiniest bit as our color goes lighter we use less of it we put less of it on the tree I'm really just gonna kind of pick one spot in this tree I kind of like this little area right in here and that's where I'm gonna put this color for the most part you know I might let it travel out beyond that a bit just so it doesn't look like there's a yellow polka dot on my tree See, I'll take the tiniest hint of it up in here. Maybe just a tiny hint of it there. And same on this little tree. Let's do our last thing to the road. All right, so I'm gonna get a tiny bit of my alizarin. I didn't clean off my brush. And I'm just gonna kinda come in here into some of these flat spots and just kinda dash on. Let's see, let's go into our orange. Very little paint, don't go overboard with this. I'm just kinda dashing on little hints of this color to the edges of the road, as well as in the wheel ruts here. And go back and forth with your yellow and your orange and all of that see very subtle just little tiny bits I had to pick up just a little bit of water. There we go. Much better coverage now. It just kind of looks like maybe there's some leaves or something that have fallen down here. Just little points. I think that's probably gonna be about it. All right, to do our little branches, I'm gonna go to my long liner, wet it in my jar, and get my Payne's Gray. Really load the brush up with, with that color. Remember, if you're not using soft body, just add a little extra water to it. I'm gonna poke into just a tiny bit of white and just kind of pick a spot and say, oh, there's a little branch right there. I'll stop it at the foliage and just kind of continue it somewhere. So like we did with the branches on the tree in the old truck video. Don't get too specific. 
You know, if you're looking at this old tree, you might not see where each branch comes from or where each branch goes to. But by just kind of suggesting that there's other branches in there, you fill that whole tree with branches. So we don't have to spend, you know, I'm even just gonna come out of the foliage right there and say there's a little branch there. So we don't have to spend all day, you know, painting lots of detailed little branches and being very specific about where they come from and where they go. And we can just throw in a couple of them after the fact. And it looks like our tree is just packed with branches. You can even take this as an opportunity to add some highlights or shadows to the branches that you already have in there. I think that's pretty good. I might just do a little something here on the trunk, add a little bit of some contrast with some light and some dark, nothing real specific. I'm just smearing those colors together. About the same thing on the little tree. Oh, that was really, really white. There we go. This tree is so much smaller, so I'm really not going to do a lot to it. Occasionally, you can let the branches come over top of the foliage even. That's okay, especially on these fall trees where, you know, they might have some bare branches already. Before we finish, I'm just going to take this long liner and just kind of throw a couple little stick trees back here in the distance. Nothing too detailed. Just kind of insinuating that there's some other trees growing here. Whenever it doesn't show up because of your background color, just change it a little. So I had a little more white into that one so that it showed up. Maybe just on one of them, I'm going to get a little bit of an orange-red color, still using my long liner. And I think maybe just this tree, I'm going to come in here and just kind of lightly tap in just a few bits of some leaves. Really extend it out from those branches so that it doesn't feel, you know, too tight. A little hint of yellow, we'll just pop that in there and I think, I think for reals we're done. And then I'm going to sign it. Oh look, and I didn't even end up changing this corner that I said that I hated because now it doesn't bother me. I hope you enjoyed painting this one with me, and I hope that you learned a little bit about creating atmospheric perspective, as well as how an underpainting can be useful, and it really doesn't matter what color you choose. That's completely up to you and the look that you're going for. Feel free to take the techniques and the composition or any elements that you like from this painting and mix it up. You can create a painting for any season that you like using the exact same techniques that I've used here. Thank you as always for painting with me, everyone. I'll see you next time.